DJ Leroy. Night Watchman. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. All right. Well, I'm holed up here in Wilmington, Delaware. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, uh, me and Mrs., you know, we're having a, a time. A, can you say getaway? Hey, hey, it's a nice city. I have family there. Oh, you do? I know that. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day or whatnot, that this was also one of the uh, station stops for the Underground Railroad. All right. Well, thankfully, you're in better accommodations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering whether or not family all also happened to be conductors on the Underground Railroad. Was that uh, the claim to fame or what? No, I don't think my family goes back that far in Delaware. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yep. But certainly that far in Harlem, huh? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you want to take a little thunder there. But anyway, on that note, Night Watchman, one of the other things, you know your guy, uh, you know I have a new hit, right? I do know that, uh, yes. And so with that, I, I no longer I gave up one of my passions, and that, of course, being what? Basketball. Oh, I thought you were going to try out the, you're not, you're not going to try out the, the warranty on it. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. No. So, so, so LeBron's records will probably stand. Right, right, because, right. Okay. But, and, and, but, your, <laughs> and your jersey still hangs in the rafters. It just doesn't have your name on it. <laughs> you had to go there. You just had to go there. You know, forget that. Uh, uh, let, let's get it popping. Let's, even though I'm from the BX, you know. Definitely Harlem is synonymous with some serious, famous basketball. You know, of course, everyone has kind of like heard about the, uh, you know, Harlem Globetrotters, right? But who the heck, uh, and tell me this, Night Watchman, do you remember the Harlem Wrens? Absolutely. But, I, you, you know, I don't, I don't remember it growing up. It's something that I learned more about as an adult. I'm not trying to front. On it oh, okay, because you know, every now and then you do try to steal some thunder. You know this, right? Uh, I, I, I don't need to steal thunder. I bring the thunder. <laughs> you know, forget that. Forget that. Look, <laughs> let, let's bring out an author, yeah, let's... a writer, someone who knows about that particular history, and that, of course, could only be Mr. Claude Johnson. Bring Claude Johnson, hey. welcome to Soul Lounge yes. Prime Time. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here with you all and. Wow, full circle uh, WHCR as well, man. Oh, so, so you're familiar with WHCR? Yeah, I used to be, uh, every once in a while I was a guest of Mr. John Isaacs, the one and only uh, former Rens uh, and Washington Bears superstar, Hall of Famer. That was when Zach wow. Husser was there, rest in peace. And that was also Stephanie Stepp, who was the producer, and some other people. And uh, every once in a while on a Sunday, we would get up there and start talking. People would call in. It was so much fun. It was really a memorable time. Well, well, Claude, get ready. We're bringing back the fun, okay? Let's go. <laughs> All right, here you go. And, uh, I, and Claude, I do understand that you actually did a, an article back in 2015 with this next guy I'm going to bring out here. And that, of course, can only be uh, Kevin Magruder. Kevin! Let's go. How are you, Claude? I'm doing great. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Curtis. Thank you, man. Thanks, hey, thanks for the man. invitation. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but yo, I did not know that your roots go that deep, Kevin. I, I had no idea in terms of real estate at ADC, Abyssinia Development Corporation. Correct. Uh, I was uh, among the group of the founders, yeah, about exactly. 15 uh, members of Abyssinia in the mid-80s. We were meeting after work kind of plotting to establish a development corporation. And then eventually became director of real estate development there from uh, 1991 to 96, and then chief operating officer 96 to 97 there. Beautiful, beautiful. And Night Watchman, just so you know, he's the one who turned me on to uh, Philip Payton, okay? Not you, okay? But on that note. Oh, that's because you don't listen to me, that's all. <laughs> Left, Kevin, left. Kevin's so knowledgeable about every single aspect of real, Harlem real estate going back to those days, way back when Harlem wasn't even black yet, right? So that was wow. a huge resource on that. Yeah, and, probably the, the world's most form, foremost expert. And interestingly, right. uh, in the 90s, that block, 131st Street between Lenox and 5th, that's where mm -hmm. Abyssinia has a senior citizen building, a condo apartment, other developments, and uh, that was Philip Payton. His house is on that block too. Wow, didn't so know that. Wow. Early on, there. 
Well, well, guys, you know what? Before we even started talking about, let's say, uh, the Wrens, that historic uh, basketball troupe, right? Uh, one of the other people who I actually made contact with, Night Watchman, was a guy who we, we share, of course, the stage, and that would be Stuyvesant. And that can only be my man, uh, Mr. Glenn Hunter. Bring him out here. Glenn, come on out here. Yes, how's everyone doing? Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be in the company of Kevin and Claude. I I admire both of them, and I'm fortunate to be their friends. And um, thank you for having me here. I'm going to learn something, um, I'm sure. And um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. And, 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 also, and I just want to say Glenn is being humble because he actually runs an organization called the Harlem Cultural Archives. And uh, he's also a great uh, Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's going to tell me more. And he's also going to tell me, and Glenn, you're going to tell me where I can also get some merch, okay? I want some Ren's merch. So you send me that link, okay? Or yes. you can just check with Claude because he's got all the merch. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see. Swag, yes. Swaggy P. I'm loving this. Oh, okay, man. So, Off the uh, chain. Yes, to <laughs> totally. Uh, I, I guess one of the other ones that, that I have to actually do, and Night Watchman, you can help me on this one. This would, of course, be our Deputy Burn President, and also, more importantly, I'm going to say a member of, I understand, this organization called Harlem Community Development Corporation. She's on, on the board there, too. But she is the person who first approached, uh, let's say, our organization related to, that's right, uh, Keisha Sutton James. But that, uh, welcome, Keisha. Hey, Keisha. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Keisha. Thrilled to be here with all of you. Y'all needed a woman on the screen. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. Yes. No Definitely. question. You, you know what? A a a Keisha, you're so right because we had gotten some flack about where the women? Where the women? Because we know that you have guys you? are the driving force. Yes, we have. And I watch used to get, uh, I was just joking. Go ahead. No, Chris <laughs> used to get flack from his sister who. You know, rest in peace passed last year, but she would give us flack for not having enough women on. And we'd say, well, Marlene, why don't you come on? We really need your edges. No, I don't want to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Your know, family is is what family does. But you Absolutely. know what? OK, let's get let's get it popping. I knew about the uh, of course, the Harlem Glo Globetrotters, as I mentioned. But Claude, tell me about this uh, group, the Harlem Wrens, please. That forgotten history. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the Harlem Wrens, this is their 100th anniversary. They uh, were formed in 1923, played their first game in November of 1923. And, you know, our organization, I run an organization called the Black Fives Foundation. And mm -hmm. our mission is to, you know, research, preserve and showcase and teach and honor the pre-NBA history of African-Americans in basketball. And the the epitome, the, the quintessential most successful team from that period was the New York Reds. And they played at the Renaissance Casino. That's what it was called. It was a ballroom at the corner of West 138th and 7th back then, but Adam Clayton Powell now uh, renamed. And they won 85% um, of their games over a 25-year wow. period playing 150 games a season, which is like winning 69 or 70 games a season in the NBA for 25 straight years in a row. Incredible. And so we're trying to celebrate that uh, that team this year. Um, of course, there's merch, but we also want to have some other commemorative, um, you know, installations around around Harlem, and that's why Glenn is is on, and, and Kevin and Keisha, of course, and you know, mm -hmm. Keisha had some great ideas, which I know she wants to share, and. Mm -hmm. And so it was just an honor. I wrote a book and there's some other things that, that, you know, helped me to learn more about the Reds. I was not obviously part of that era, but I was mm -hmm. friends with, uh, with John Isaacs, Mr. Isaacs, mm -hmm. who was uh, one of the last um, surviving players on that team. And wow. so that, that, you know, gave me a lot of great memories. I actually, I actually just want to show off. This is a yeah. photo of me with Mr. I, let's see. Mm -hmm. Back when when he he passed away, but oh um, yes, that yes, was us. It, that was him wearing some gear that we we gave him, you know. And <laughs> back when I had an afro, I don't know if you could see that. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> very nice, very oh. nice. And, yeah. and you know what? What what are the other things? I guess I got to uh, find out too, there, Claude. Uh, and and Kevin, did you know about the Rens before you and he, him uh, collaborated and wrote the article? Uh, tell me about that. Yes, the the Renaissance Ballroom and Theater Complex. Uh, that mm -hmm. was one of my projects when I was at Abyssinia Development Corporation. So I I had been interested in history at a ho as a hobby even before. Now I'm a history professor at Antioch College, but um, so I started studying that history and pretty much knew it from the beginning. And that history is really what uh, inspired the Development Corporation to really want to regain control of that building and try to, to redevelop it. And so, um, so my knowledge went back to that period. And actually, um, I met uh, the niece of Bob Douglas, who was the manager of the Renaissance, um, uh, Gloria Vanderpool. And mm. uh, she's, I just actually, I just saw her quoted in an article recently in the Times about the Renaissance. And so, wow. um, so yeah, so I, I, I did understand that history, but don't know nearly as much as Claude was about <laughs> the, the Rens itself or the, the team. Gotcha, gotcha. And and you know what, my uh, Stuyvesonian there, Glenn, so do tell me about your, your interests, because you didn't play any uh, b ball over at Stuyveson, or did you? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, 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 so tell us about your, your involvement and what you're doing there to preserve that legacy. Well, um, several years back, um, we initiated a, a process of getting the street co-named after the Wrens on 138th and, you know, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. So, you know, the process is you have to get some signatures and um, there has to be no pushback from the community and presenting it to the community board, one of the committees there, and then it goes in front of the full board. And once they mm -hmm. submit it to city council as a recommendation, they vote on it and then it becomes law once the mayor signs it. So it took about it took about five years, but mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be denied. And um, <laughs> fortunately, well, and I was fortunate enough to know a couple of the Wrens and Claude can fill you in on them. Um, one of them is a uh, Puggy Bell and Dolly King. They both lived in the Riverton, mm -hmm. and um, I knew them growing up. And uh, Puggy Bell and I used to sit and talk basketball all the time. And these guys, you know, um, I revered them, and I used to just sit there in awe and listen to them talk about how they would, you know, just pick apart other teams, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, they kind of taught everybody how to play the game properly, the way they. Mm -hmm the game now so it's mm. i was blessed to know those guys and I, i'll never forget them Beautiful. you know glenn, glenn is the person who gave me that sign right there that's actually a copy of that street sign it's called new york uh, oh. Rams, new york Rams let get, court and, let me um, see that uh, and it's uh -huh. on the corner if you want to go see it you know you can go to the corner of west 138th and adam clayton powell yes and you, yes and see, you know it's appropriately named new york Rens. New York Wrens Court. And, um, you know, I just want to e echo what Glenn said about the Wrens and the, the the mentorship that they had, you know, around the community. I used to drive around with uh, Mr. Isaacs, who was, for 50 years, he was a counselor, a youth counselor at the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club in the Bronx. Mm. And, so, and so we would drive around and he'd have the window open hanging out the window and yeah, yeah, yo, get back in there, go there, reach for that, you know, and it's like people that he knew from like 50 years ago that are back out, you know, and they would say, hey, Mr. I, you know, and we would just be riding around. I didn't say anything. I would just be listening to his stories. So that that's real, like the, the impact that they had on the community is real. And, and funny that you mentioned that uh, too there, Claude, because another person who said that they were also uh, Mr. Isaac's chauffeur is someone who you know, and that could only be Russell Schuler. Wow. wow. Yes, yes. So both of you guys had that particular duty of chauffeuring around that legend. And you know what, uh, Claude, like I said, this particular uh, person actually just, you know, she kind of like poked the bear and said, you know what, let's do this. Let's have a commemorative uh, type place where people can celebrate this history. And uh, Keisha, you, you, you have to tell us about it. What, what was that inspiration? Oh. You're on mute. Oh, mute, mute, mute. mute. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, my dog was making a little noise in the back. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I, uh, first of all, um, 
I grew up a few blocks away um, from the Renaissance ballroom, and my grandmother would would tell me stories of going there. My my dad would tell me stories of going there with my with my great grandmother, who would go mm. for because my great grandmother loved to dance, so mm-hmm, she would go mm-hmm. for, the, for the for the you know the dances. Yes. Um, and my and then my dad would and his friends or his cousin I don't remember who they would just kind of be around like getting into trouble and, you know, <laughs> the tables and probably looking up, up people's skirts. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's part of the memory actually. That I think I didn't just make that up. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, um, so I grew up knowing about it. Um, mm-hmm. I am. I was told that my great grandfather was a Wren, but I'm not mm. so sure. I don't know. I've, okay. I've, I've got to check the book. Uh, he, he was Patrick O'Farrell. I'm actually looking at a picture of him right in front of me because uh, mm-hmm. he, he played for the St. Mark's team, uh, St. Mark's Church on, on mm. 139th. Um, oh yes. And I'm looking at a picture of him uh, in his in the 1921-22 um, basketball season. Wow! Um, his, wow! With the other players, um, that's oh, nice, nice. That's incredible. That's yes. O'Farrell, my great grandfather. Um, <laughs> um, but anywho, what was I going to say? Uh, so when uh, Glenn and Charles called about this, it was really, really, really exciting. Um, I, I happen to have, you know, really been brought up to understand the importance of living, uh, rather lifting up our history. Um, mm-hmm. And now uh, I don't know when exactly the term was coined, but I probably heard of it a few years ago, and that's erasure. Um, mm. I and what erasure was from my mm. um, really from my grandfather as um, and really my whole family, but a, a lot my grandfather because um, you know some of the work. My grandfather was Percy Sutton and mm-hmm. worked to preserve uh, to save the Apollo Theater at yep. the time from becoming a church. Was first <laughs> delivered. Um, was uh, was first driven by his desire to maintain our history um, yes. and, and our places of history. Um, so I was really excited about this. Um, and uh, Glenn and Charles said they wanted to put in a, uh, a reflective bench on mm-hmm. uh, Avenue on uh, Adam Clayton Powell on um, on uh, 139th, 38th Street on the mm-hmm. uh, the pedestrian safety. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah, like the mall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that idea. And then I came up with another idea and we're working on both of them and hopefully we'll be able to get these things through. It's a lot of work to be done to get it done. Um, and, but I'm, mm. you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, Glenn and Charles can get, it done, can get it done. But the second idea is essentially to make a, um, a walk of fame that would lift up the, you know, small like brass plates in the street around the yes. print of um, around the footprint of what was the Renaissance um, ballroom and have these plates um, tell a little bit of the history about the Wrens, as well as, of course, lift up the legacies of the the most noteworthy uh, Wrens, many of whom and, and Charles can share the numbers. He, he's a brilliant uh historian and statistician, if you will. Um, but many of them went on to become, went into the NBA and be, went on, or excuse me, I don't know if they went into the NBA. They went on to become NBA um, Hall of Famers, um, but also include some of those who, you know, the NBA hasn't acknowledged, but have been um, also, were also extraordinary in their own right. So we're hoping we can get this through um, the Department of Transportation and, mm-hmm. and uh, that, you know, that, raise the money, you know, mm-hmm. all the things like basically, you know, it's on um, the Black uh-huh. Lives Foundation to, you know, get all the pieces together and I'm helping yes. shepherd, you know, through government. That's my my job. My role. <laughs> and I was the brilliant person who came up with a brilliant idea, apparently. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were. Well, yeah. actually, you know, it was Glenn who put who put us in touch and, um, uh-huh. and uh, you know, but Keisha, you might be thinking of my friend Charles Wade and uh, and Joyce, who you keep, but you would use would he would he use uh, the name Charles? But I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's <laughs> cool. No worries. And, and, and okay, so backing I'm up for a second now. Caffeine. 
Hey, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, so one of the things, uh, certainly, I do remember this uh, famous uh, film uh, starring, of course, Richard Pryor, and that, of course, being Bingo Long, Traveling All-Stars, right? Mm -hmm. And, Claude, I did not really know in terms of basketball that there was also a similar history in terms of traveling uh, teams. So tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, first, I, so you see, I got all this Wrens gear on, and yep. it's just that, you know, like, probably 20 years, I've been doing this for 20 years, um, back mm. when the NBA uh, started celebrating what it called its uh, 50th anniversary in 1996, and they came out with a book uh, called the NBA Encyclopedia of Basketball. It's an 800-page book, but it only had three pages devoted to earlier black teams, right? Wow. And so I was, wow. I was sitting there, and I had read Arthur Ashe's book, A Hard Road to Glory, which has a mm. section on basketball, and I and you list, you know, several dozen, you know, about a dozen or more teams that were African-American basketball teams. And I thought, well, how come nobody knows about this? And it started me on a quest where I started going to Harlem to the basement of the Schomburg when before they had, you know, everything was digitized. You, you had to go in and look at the microfilm and you had to actually mm -hmm. page by page by page mm -hmm. print it out and look at it. And so I discovered that there were you know, dozens of African-American teams that, that emerged and flourished. And, um, you know, every week there was an account in the either the Amsterdam News or the New York Age or other black newspapers of that time where I, where I started realizing, wow, these are all these teams. And, and um, since I was in licensing at the time at the league office, mm -hmm. I was working at the NBA, Mm -hmm. I started realizing, you know, there's a language that people speak through their through their gear. And so that's that's when we started to trademark the names and logos of these teams, because our mission was really to conserve this history so that it didn't get pimped out um, mm -hmm. and, and, and basically diminished. Can I say that? I don't know if I can say that. But, yeah. <laughs> yes, you can say that. And get watered down, you know, and yeah, so okay. now we're at the point, you know, and I've, I'm just... You know, I wrote a book um, called The Black Fives, which is yes. an epic story of this history. It humanizes the pioneers. And, um, you know, so I'm using this opportunity to celebrate, but it's also because it's their 100th anniversary. And you're right, there were dozens of these teams. Uh, they traveled the country. Um, they played uh, primarily against white teams, beat most mm -hmm. of them. Um, yeah. If they didn't beat them the first time, they beat them the, the next nine times. Right. And so, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, how did an all black team go into the Midwest to an all white state like Wisconsin, all white town like Oshkosh, play that team, win, leave and then get invited back? And it's because they were, you know, like a traveling, um, traveling economic stimulus package. Right. That would go yeah. around, would come from miles around to go to the game and go to the restaurants and the bars and the saloons and merchants and everything. And so, you know, that's, that's where this starts to become a fascinating story. And, um, but what's interesting is aside from <clears throat> that uh, street co-naming, um, there's nothing else in New York city that even commemorates or acknowledges or knows or recognizes this team. And so that's why it's important for us to have that walk of fame uh, mm -hmm. And then also a commemorative bench with a, with a you know like a historical marker. We also are uh, we we receive funding for a court repainting. So we're trying to decide which court outdoor playground court in Harlem that would be. And so there's a lot going on, but it's 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 kind of right. The time is right, and and uh, it's about time actually. Cool. Absolutely. And, and you know what, uh, Kevin, one of the things you as a historian, you certainly do know in terms of, let's say, real estate in Harlem, no doubt. Uh, and what, one of the things that Claude mentioned in terms of historic markers or uh, landmark preservation type things, why is there such a lack in our community, man? Do tell. I mean, it's uh, kind of a, a symbol of the disparities that in general, uh, racial disparities that property, so blackness is not valued <laughs> in mm, our society. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. properties associated with blackness are not valued either. And um, Michael Henry Adams has been on a campaign uh, for 30 years to get mm -hmm. more properties landmarked. And there's a tension there because private owners, even when they're black, are mm -hmm. often reluctant because landmark 
uh, designation does come with restrictions on what yes. they can do with the building, at least on the exterior and sometimes on the interior, depending. And, mm -hmm. and that came into play with the Renaissance. I mean, if I could just maybe try to give a brief history of yep. the building. Take um, it. It's really two buildings. Uh, so the ballroom is the one that is more famous at the mm -hmm. corner of 138th and 7th Avenue, but at the corner of 137th and 7th Avenue is the theater. And mm -hmm. uh, the theater, I think it's about a 300 seat theater. So they're, they're built in stages. Uh, if I remember right, the ballroom is built first and then the theater, I think maybe about a year later. Interestingly, uh, the ballroom opens in 1923. That's the same year that Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem Open. Wow. Wow. Um, so mm. this is a centenary. Abyssinian, that, that's the fourth location for Abyssinian. Uh -huh. um, and so those histories are intertwined. And after the heyday of the Renaissance, the, I would say probably the by the 50s and 60s is when the people are going other places for social uh -huh. events and it goes through a series of owners. And I moved to New York in 1982. By that time, the Renaissance was not being used, but there was the storefronts were being right. used. And then soon after that, the whole thing was closed down. And eventually it uh, came under the ownership of a, a, a person named uh, Baruch Singer who, mm -hmm. uh, lived downtown. He was an investor. Mm -hmm. He had financing from Dime Savings Bank. And he ended up um, getting behind on that mortgage. Dime took control of it. Mm -hmm. um, in the early 90s, there was a savings and loan crisis. And Dime, if I remember right, they went under and the property mm -hmm. became part of the Federal Resolution Trust Corporation. Uh, and yes. At that time, Abyssinian approached Charles Rangel all of those assets of that corporation were being auctioned off as a group. Mm -hmm. And Abyssinian approached Dr. Calvin Butts, who was, uh, by that time he was pastor, asked Charles Rangel if he could help to extract the Renaissance from that so that Abyssinian and a group of investors, um, Black entrepreneurs from Harlem who had put up money, they could bid on that. And mm -hmm. that was successful. And so Abyssinian gained control of it, created an affiliate organization and began putting together a redevelopment plan. And that's what I was uh, charged with doing as the project manager of that. And the idea was to really bring it back to its original function with the ballroom being used for social events, things like that, the theater uh, possibly being used for live theater. The challenge with that by the 90s was that uh, there's no parking. Right, right. And by that time, yeah. that's what people were looking for. And we we just uh, were not, we had some bites. Marriott was very close to becoming involved. And right when we were about to sign something, the people we had been working with were laid off. And so the whole new group didn't want to have anything to do with it. I left Abyssinia in 1997. And then people, other people who followed me continued to, to move it forward. But... Mm -hmm. In between there, to your Landmarks question, Landmarks, they did want to designate that during that mm. 1990s period. And uh, Abyssinia Development Corporation asked them to hold off until the development plan was put together. Gotcha. And, and they deferred. Um, by the 2000s, the property um, was deteriorating. Mm -hmm. uh, Claude Glenn and I met um, during a campaign led by Michael Adams when on, a, on Sunday mornings, he was at that corner saying, save Harlem now. <laughs> After the <laughs> Abyssinian to sign petitions and I joined, I was living in Ohio by that time, but I came back periodically and joined in those protests. And we were, we, we knew it was unlikely that the whole thing was going to come back. And right. eventually the development corporation sold the complex to BRP developers which is mm -hmm. uh, a black owned company. And by that time, when we were protesting, that sale had happened. And so what we were trying to do is get BRP to at least save the exterior. If you look at Small's Paradise at 135th mm -hmm. and 7th Avenue, that was also one of my projects. Ah, okay. We were tr also trying to bring that back. 
we didn't have we had some nibbles so sean combs <laughs> came to uh -huh. look at that and i remember i i lifted up the gate and he looked in at all the deterioration because it had skylights and there was mm -hmm. a lot of water damage he got out of his town black town car looked in that building and he said i'm not going in there and got uh -huh. in his car um, <laughs> eventually uh abyssinian was able to have that as the site of Thurgood Marshall Academy, but Got they were you. able to save the exterior wall. So when you look at that, that school, you mm -hmm. see the walls mm -hmm. of Small's Paradise. That's what we were hoping to have there with the Renaissance. BRP said it was deteriorated too far mm -hmm. and they had a plan. And the most we were able to get, it was all shiny chrome and windows and we, mm -hmm you know, advocated that at least they have some link to the Renaissance. And so that brickwork that you see there on the apart, the condominium building that is there, yeah. that was their concession to uh, it. And, you know, so I, it was a big disappointment to me after working on it for so long to see that outcome. I wish it had been different. Yes. But yes. I do think I, I am really pleased that um, what Keisha is doing is going to keep that erasure that she was mentioning from <laughs> happening. Because if you don't have something at the site, if you move to Harlem in the last 10 years, you don't really know what was there because that building's been gone mm -hmm. uh, almost probably almost 10 years. And so we can't bring it back, but we shouldn't no. allow the fact that the building isn't there to allow us to forget that really important history. And it's important on the development side, too. That was developed by Black people. It was mm. one of the few Harlem Renaissance sites that was Black controlled and built. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's important. And I don't know that BRP, I, I don't know if they felt hurt by the advocacy, mm -hmm. but they could lean into that, too, that they're in that legacy. Right. And right. they should own that that I'm disappointed that they didn't do what we wanted, but I'm pleased <laughs> that it's black yeah. developers doing something because they are following in that legacy. And Absolutely. They should own that um, as well as I hope they will support the efforts that are being made to, yeah. you know, really link that site with the RENs because it's very important. Well, Keisha, we're, I'm talking about pushing a boulder up the hill. How's that boulder uh, progressing? Uh, first, I just want to say BRP is um, supportive. Um, nice. Congrats. Nice. I'm, I wanted to, it, they have expressed support to me. Um, they took it to, um, we, frankly, or, I, I don't know that we actually need the um, support of the property owners. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it appears, according to DOT, that we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but we so, we sought it, um, and so I had an initial conversation with BRP. They took it to the board of the condo, uh, the condo board that you know that exists now, of which they are a a, a board member, mm -hmm. um, and they said they are looking forward to you know hearing more about the project. So they are you know positive, you know progress positive feedback from um on that side. Um, and last week, yes, last week, um, uh, I was able to set up a call with Department of Transportation with um, Glenn and Claude, not Charles. Claude. <laughs> 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 and <Nice>. through <laughs> which, you know, they learned all about what the process will entail. And there's frankly, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work on, um, on black fives to put mm -hmm. forth all you know the proposal and um and uh uh you know there's obviously insurance that needs to be procured there's a lot of elements that need to be put maintenance. together and yeah, um, yeah maintenance yeah. all gotcha. the things so that was just last week uh, i know mm -hmm. they are are working on putting some things together and then we you know there are several steps that we'll need to go through before you know many steps uh uh, before we can get um, approval from both DOT um, and uh, I forgot there's another agency we've got to get approval from. Um, Urban Design. I, well, no. mm, yeah. Urban Design Institute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah commission. Uh, okay. I can't. I'm sorry. 
I, I'm not recalling, but um, it's going to be a while. Um, mm -hmm. But it's something, you know, that however I can be helpful in pushing, you know, and pushing things along, I will, I'm happy to do because um, it's an important part of our history. And I'm so glad, Kevin, that you brought up the fact that uh, the Renaissance ballroom had been built and designed. I don't know. Remember, I don't remember. This is something I, I, I talk to people about. Um, but of course, I don't remember because you can see I don't remember a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. There, it was a black developer um, builder, if I'm not mistaken. They had it gone. Was, it was owned. It was capitalized. It was designed and built by 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 Afri you know by by uh, African Americans, uh, West Indians, uh, but mm -hmm. people of color. And that was their whole source of pride. And I, I'm just going to read a little statement that I just want to point out that. People from all over the world understand and know about the Rens, right? So mm -hmm. they come from. So this could be really like a tourist attraction, but more importantly, it's something for the community to celebrate and rally around. And you know, meet me at New York Rens Court. Let's go sit down and have coffee on the bench, and let's think about the history and talk about it. And people can now stop there on tours of Harlem. Buses can stop and get out and lect have a lecture or a conversation about it. But back in 1920, when they were trying to raise money for this project, um, the Colorado Statesman, which was a, a black newspaper, uh, wrote, racial solidarity necessary to advance. That was the headline. And at the bottom of that article, it said, they were talking about this building, okay? At the bottom of that article, it said, that building, once erected, will stand forever as a monument of our solidarity have wow. we not learned? Have we not learned? Is what it ends with, right? In 1920. So um, I, I, it's possible that BRP didn't know anything about this history when they went about doing what they were doing. It's possible that Abyssinian didn't know. But they must have known a little bit because, you know, this was where so much happened. It was really a cultural shrine. It wasn't just a basketball mecca. Abyssinian so, knew because I, I knew. <laughs> Right. And I was working there. And that's yeah. why, you know, I was in charge of it. And we talked about it all the time. That history. Mm -hmm. That's why. So yeah. you had George Weldon, Thelma Goods, Goodwin, Ed Myers, mm -hmm. Curtis Mills. These were black entrepreneurs and others who put up $25,000 each. It's very mm -hmm. similar to what you're describing, Claude. And this yeah. was in probably 1992. So that Abyssinian could get control of that. And, yeah. and some of them... <laughs> You know, they're all passed away now. They mm. were old enough to have been there. You know, right. well, times. Well, and that, so that's why it hit so deep. To, you know, because we didn't have to tell them the history because they lived it. And mm. the reason yeah. why I do mention BRP's role is they named that complex. They named that condominium the Rennie. If yeah. you don't mm -hmm. yeah. bring this yeah. history forward, then it's just the name. Yeah, but and it's, a, it's also blasphemy because you know, it's almost like destroying something and then naming it after the thing you destroyed, like what, you know, what's going on there with that, you know? And right. so, but, but I would say this. Claude, I don't know if you remember that during our advocacy, they mentioned that they would consider having something in the mm -hmm. interior mm -hmm. related yeah. to it. Yeah. And I don't know if they've done that, but yeah. if they haven't, well, this is the time <laughs> to yeah. call them on that. Well, I mean, you know, like, a, and, and go ahead. Uh, and, and tell me, in terms of the marching and, and what uh, Kevin just mentioned, are, are some elements uh, been preserved besides the exterior wall and stuff like that? What else is in there, man? Tell me. No. No? And nothing that I know of. I know they... Not even they, the exterior wall. Just, yeah, that's just correct. Out, that's all I know that's been preserved. Yeah. Kevin mentioned right. brickwork. It's really just they put up some bricks for the look, but I saw them driving away with a uh, pickup truck full of the antique bricks that they mm. that were that were at the demolished site, you can see that photo in Kevin and I. The article that we wrote, uh, you can you can Google it. It was called uh, "Requiem for a Demolished Harlem Shrine," mm -hmm. and long read, but it gives you the full background, Kevin's experiences, and what he his role was, and then also you know my perspective from the history and the importance of it and you know even the even the bricks right like if you look at the bricks themselves they're all stamped antique bricks were, were stamped like with a brand so it was aaa so if you look up who was the owner of the aaa 
brick making company. It was a company up in on the Hudson River that was owned by it was Cuban owned, right? So all these connections uh, go, go back to you know this was really like a, 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 a statement in solidarity that was just that was really just demolished, and that's why you know there's a certain amount of sadness still. People mm-hmm. people were in tears that were watching this this process happen. You know, and, and it was very, very touching in a sad way. So I, I, but I would say that if you're listening to this and watching this now, we definitely need your support. We need um, your, we need you to rally and tell folks about it that that the New York Rens are in fact going to be celebrated. Uh, there's multiple different projects. Um, we were on a call. Keisha was on the call as well recently, and Glenn. Uh, we were talking about the court repainting. And Alan Houston was on that phone call with us. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so there's like, we're trying to gain some support because mm-hmm. once we go in front of uh, the community board and the different committees, then, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to have to speak out and say, you know, yes, there's the support from, from the local community. We have a network of um, descendants, uh, mm-hmm. really hundreds of descendants of the Black Lives era, but especially also about you know, this descendants of the New York Rens. They're living right in Harlem. Um, Absolutely. And, and Claude, back up for a second, because one of the things that you also uh, did mention is uh, the fact that, let's say, getting back to, let's say, to basketball with this traveling, the traveling Rens, I mean, there were serious, uh, as I say, uh, complications and uh, I guess other shrines where this experience was happening in New York and elsewhere, because you mentioned big time in your book about, uh, let's say, D.C., what was happening there, or traveling out to, as you say, out to Ohio and other places where, let's say, even all white crowds, man, uh, just just dug because they were going to see some quality basketball, man. So you got you got to tell me about that. That sometimes sports can transcend some of the racial racial animus that one experiences, man. Yeah, I mean, so uh, that's a great point that you're making, right? Because Again, how, how does an all-black team go all the way out to, um, you know, the Midwest or even the Pacific Northwest uh, <laughs> yeah. during the Great Depression, during, during Jim Crow, and get invited back? And mm-hmm. so one of the things that happened is that there was nothing else to do, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't have mm-hmm. movies. They didn't have social media. They didn't mm-hmm. have TV. Um, sometimes the circus came to town, you know, and then sometimes – a famous team like the New York Rens would come to town and they would build ahead of time as colored champions. Right. Right. And so right. that would make, that would make that local team want to get as, get better and keep developing so that they could eventually finally beat the Rens when they came back next year. And so, <laughs> so what, what people don't realize is that, is that it wasn't just that the Rens were this team that broke the color barrier somehow, or hey, aren't they great? They just they paved the way. It's that they helped elevate, they pushed white teams to become better, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They, and that the, the only way they could do that is if they were actually the best team in basketball. And so, mm-hmm. sure enough, in 1939, when they played that inaugural. Uh, world Championship of Professional Basketball, the Rens won that tournament by beating right. the Oshkosh All-Stars, who wow. were their nemesis, right? And so mm-hmm. that's how basketball got to where it is today. It's not because somehow we joined and became players, you know, when the NBA was formed. It's that we helped make the NBA possible in the mm-hmm. first place. And, and I, and I want, I want uh, the community and I want everyone who's watching this to really appreciate that we were there at the beginning. It's our game, but it, because it's our game, we also have the responsibility for the stewardship of it, right? And so that, mm-hmm. this is all part of that. It, and, and you know what, uh, Claude, one of the things couple, that you... Let's say a couple go ahead. About, so the go real ahead. and the business. Mm-hmm. So that, that type of complex was being built by other Black people in other parts of the country. Ah, and, okay. And so... Okay. Uh, the Walker Manufacturing Building in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was working on this project, they were renovating that. And so I went to uh, there to look at what they were doing. 
Uh, and that was like, a, another basketball shrine, yeah? Not a basketball shrine, but I'm just saying in terms of, so what basketball in terms of black is capital. part of a, a broader uh, social life of black people in yeah. cities? And it Got was it. segregated, and people mm-hmm. in the North, often white people do not understand that. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. in these Northern cities, black people were creating their own spaces that they controlled. And so yes. the Renaissance is within that. When you look at what basket, why link basketball with those sites, it's very similar to um, the Negro Leagues. You yes, look at who owns yes. these teams; they're often business people who are who have other interests. Bob Douglas, he was the manager of that complex. He mm-hmm. wanted to market that complex. If you have a winning team, people are going to want to come there. Mm-hmm. After the team played, they had dances, and so <laughs> you link all this together, and that's happening across the country. Claude talks about there's a route along the East Coast. All these teams, they knew each other. They played against each other. They kind of pushed each other. So there's an athletic side, but there's a business side and there's a real estate side to all of these things. So this is not just a local kind of uh, focus. It's not just a local subject. It has a broader implications than than just how you know, and then at all those early, all those early games, Black Fives era games, mm-hmm. including St. Mark's, which I, I shared some uh, some research that I quickly pulled up uh, for for Keisha, uh, you know, because St. Mark's had this amazing team right in Harlem, and um, the early advertisements for these games would always say basketball and dance. So basketball mm-hmm. was two words: basketball <laughs> and then dance. And so that's, that's why. That's because. Um, around 1910, right around the time that St. Mark's team was formed, uh, the phonograph and the radio became commercially available. And that Mm. meant that ragtime artists could be heard. And when people heard this music, they wanted to to dance to that music. Mm. But you can't really dance to that music in your parlor. So there was a ballroom construction craze and were some other ballrooms in in New York City, like the Manhattan Casino, that's that was uh, right over where Rucker Park is now, mm-hmm. that that served as homes for 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 this uh, for this type of activity. So this became a way for uh, patrons to watch a basketball game, as Kevin pointed out, but then also stick around for the dance because there was music being played before the game, during halftime, and after the game, and it became really a, a meaningful social event. You have to remember, thousands and thousands of black people were migrating from the South and they were mm-hmm. trying to assimilate into the city. And they didn't have, you know, anything, any way to assimilate other than through these kinds of dances and activities. And so uh, it was a symbol for uh, black empowerment, um, uh, black identity uh, throughout the Harlem Renaissance period. And that music was also connected through, through, throughout that and was a very important factor. And so it's just funny because now we're going full circle to that again, where we have, you know, people like LeBron and, and others who are trying to, you know, talk about empowerment, not trying, they are, and they are actually empowered in the platform that a- athletes and musicians and entertainers have. It's really um, a full circle, um, you know, we're seeing this, the same thing. So, uh, no, so that's why no. Claude, that's absolutely right. And and you know what, uh, Keisha, a lot of people don't know that you are, of course, uh, come from a legacy, no doubt about it, from your grandfather onward, uh, but also a serious Harlemite. And so you've done done stuff in terms of your community service before, uh, of course, becoming the, um, uh, what you call it, the deputy borough president. You're also on the board of a, a community-based organization, a few of them, as a matter of fact. And so the work that, let's say, that walk of fame, that they have outside the Apollo. You've been instrumental in doing that. So are there any other, let's say, historic landmarks that you'd like to see maybe from your office onward, maybe get involved in seeing that at least the history is preserved? I can't believe you asked this question. Um, (laughs) Because this weekend, Uh this weekend marks the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. I just recently learned this serious Harlemite whose grandfather was involved in some of the organizing for the March on Washington. 
Yes. Just learned <laughs> a couple of weeks ago when I uh, shot an interview with the other members of the Daughters of the Movement, which I can talk about um, later, mm -hmm. but it's a group of uh, women uh, who we are all daughters, uh, and in my case, granddaughter of civil rights activists and organizers and strategists and politicians and artists in the movement. Um, and we shot an interview with um, Maurice Dubois that's going to be airing on Monday. Oh, and, wow. Um, nice. Um, and uh, Monday at five o'clock. And um, what was I going to say? We, I learned uh, from, um, from, uh, oh my gosh, Boyd. Uh, Bo Boyd? Uh, uh, Her Boyd. Herb Boyd. Herb Boyd? Herb. Oh, thank yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Go ahead. We got you, Keith. So thank you so much. <laughs> I learned from Herb Boyd that the national headquarters, and I bought uh, uh, Bayard Rustin's books and so forth about this, but the national headquarters for the planning of the March on Washington was on 130th Street. 130th Street, yes. Wow. I had wow. no idea, and there's no marker of it. There's very little history of it, mm -hmm. and it's it looks like it's privately held. I mean, mm. yeah, privately owned. It looks like it's a um, a residential building right now. Literally, I as soon as I found out, I drove right to it. Like I got yep. this, <laughs> um, and um, I find it just <laughs> crying shame that like mm -hmm. someone who knows and is as intimate as I am mm -hmm. with so much of our of that history had no idea. Um, it, it's a, not just a statement as to how much more reading I need to do, but also <laughs> just what we need to be doing to lift up that history. And so um, this is something that I have not begun to work on. That's why I said I cannot believe that you asked me. <laughs> um, I, I have not begun to work on, but it's something I do want to want to and I you know again as um Kevin was saying you know when you have a private owner they may not be interested in landmark yes yes I would right. love to have some marker of some sort if not a landmark some sort of a marker that um and also you know press around the fact that this is <clears throat> yes this is uh, in, right here right here right. like anybody can access it it's, it's incredible yeah. Yes. I think I think this conversation we're having is so important because we walk around Harlem and most people don't are not aware of the history that is around so many of the streets that we just be walking by, whether it be 130th Street. And I did know about that. That's actually a couple of um, um, uh, houses down from my great grandmother's. Uh, brownstone, which was purchased in 1924. <laughs> you know, wow. And, um, so I knew about that. And then there's 133rd Street, with the, which was a jazz street, which was filled with, with jazz speakeasies between um, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard and Malcolm X Boulevard. And I do use those names, even though the historic <laughs> names we use don't oh. lift up our ancestors. So th this conversation we're having is of 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 um, so much importance, and as you say, erasure erasure is a real thing. Sometimes I like to call it eracism because oh, you, you usually I watch there, 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 there is a um, but this is not about eracism because this is about we have to preserve this. If this is not that's preserved, it. that's on us. It's not on it's not on anyone else. So um, the, the work that we're doing, this conversation that we're having about the Wrens, and it's not just about basketball, it's about our culture. Yes, yeah, I mean, yes. Even, uh, Kevin yes. mentioned, if oh, I may. Um, uh, uh, hold on, one second. Uh, go ahead, Glenn. What, what did you want to say? Go no, ahead. it's just very interesting that you mentioned that because um, not too long ago, I wrote an editorial for the Harlem World uh, magazine, and Kevin was so nice to... Um, contribute to it, you know, having us place for us to tell our own story. And what you just said, Night Watchman, about walking past certain areas and making that connection back to their history is something that we really must do before it's too late. And like I said, Kevin um, contributed to the article and um, all of these, the Renz is a story. What Keisha just told me that I didn't know before is a story. We have a 
We really need to have a place to tell our own story in our words so that it doesn't get, you know, diluted or caught up in a Google search. And this is all music to my ears because, again, um, the more people that understand how important it is to preserve it and be able to make that connection, the better off we'll be. And um, thank you for bringing that up because this is but the reason we, we started this historical society um, 15 years ago. So mm-hmm. thank you for mm-hmm. having me so I could share that perspective as well. Absolutely. And uh, Night Watchmen, uh, definitely, like I said, we may have to have them back. You know this, right? We will have to have them back. Uh, Keisha, we, we've been talking about it for too long. We need to have the Daughters of the Movement on the show. Um, we, we, we need all of it, you know, because we, we are here for this conversation. Um, it is uh, something that, you know, we are informed by our past and our past and understanding our past informs what our future is going to be. Absolutely. And and one of the things I got I got to say, though, uh, Night Watchman, is that we will absolutely have everyone back. But I, I did understand, though, Night Watchman, that you did actually put some raisins in the potato salad. I heard that. Oh, okay. please. Stop <laughs> it. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> From a man who can't cook and that, never <laughs> been in the kitchen in your life other than the clean dishes. Don't try to talk. Don't, don't, don't try to put that on me, man. I will put my potato salad up against yours any day uh, of the week. Uh, but let's not okay. talk about that. Let's talk about how people can get some of this yes. great, great gear. swag. That's right. All right, the swag. there you go. Ooh, there it is. Baby. So it, it is right. online. It can be found at shop.blackfives.org. So mm-hmm. you know, go out and get some of this Ren's gear. Um, as 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 we talked about earlier. You know, wearing these colors, wearing these logos is a way of carrying on the conversation without having to open your mouth. How about uh, that? Uh, that sounds good, Night Watchman. So, <laughs> so for sure, uh, folks, this is going to be our lightning round. Uh, like I said, you will be coming uh, invited back. But in the meantime, let's say let's have some uh, closing thoughts, uh, Kevin. Well, I'm, I'm just happy to see that uh, this movement to focus on the Renaissance and the Wrens is uh, revived. And I'm, I'm just really pleased because it's a really important Harlem story. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and of course, you're going to let us know when you come back east, uh, hanging out in Harlem again, right? Definitely. <laughs> good, good. Uh, Glenn, some parting shots. Um, just honored to be part of this conversation. Um, like I said, this is these are the stories that need to be preserved and told and um, memorialized. And again, thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Keisha, do tell. Um, I um, I just wanted to lift up the fact that uh, obviously this is our black, you know, our history. It's Black history, um, but but I think the reason it's so 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 important is that it is American history. And uh, if we do not tell our contributions uh, to American history, we will have people like Governor DeSantis all day long yes. saying it does not exist, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I think, you know, frankly, that the March on Washington, um, all of it is, but the March on Washington, I mean, you cannot, there is like that event um, and that speech are. Yes you know, in the canons of, of world documentation and for that to have been planned in mm-hmm. here in Harlem, same thing with the Reds. <laughs> uh, you know, we yes. are, basketball is important. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lift it up because this is American history, not just mm-hmm. our history. It is our history as part of American history. Sorry, absolutely. that was very long ended. <laughs> no, I love, love that. You're absolutely right. That is American history. And so Claude, take us yeah, out, really- buddy. Thank you. Real quick, I just want to propose, you know, that in, you don't always have to rename a street. We can just put a commemorative marker, a historical marker. Uh, Kevin, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Kevin mentioned, you know, Philip A. Payton Jr., but there's so many others. Where did Bob Douglas live? Where did different uh, games take place? Where mm-hmm. was the Commonwealth Casino? What about the Manhattan Casino? And uh, as Kevin said, it's symbolic of a, a much bigger picture in terms of preserving black history. So let's do it. Beautiful, beautiful. Night Watchman, my brother, 
Uh, yes, I will let you claim Harlem as your birthplace, all right? Uh, you have no standing to let me claim anything <laughs> from the Bronx. All, always, I, 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 I know you're part of an organization that has Harlem in his first name, but uh, <laughs> don't don't try me. <laughs> I've got my folding chair right here, okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's too funny. Yes, that yes. is too funny. So, <laughs> night, night Watchmen, if you please, Take us home, buddy. We've been listening to uh, WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem, Soul Lounge, primetime show. Also live streaming on YouTube and Facebook. And you can find us on your favorite podcast platform. Ask uh, Siri, ask Alexa uh, to play the latest Soul Lounge primetime show. We want to thank our guests for coming and sharing their insights, their experience, and their knowledge about our history and culture um, you all have a, a, a an open invitation to come back. And yes. thanks for listening. You can always find us on Monday nights. Exactly. And, and Night Watchmen, just so you know, we definitely have uh, Kevin back because he's going to talk about black real estate. You think that you've been knowledging me. No. Kevin's the one, okay? So just so you know. Yeah, I know. Call somebody in. Yes, you need, you, you need <laughs> black, a surrogate. Black okay. first word. Black first word. <laughs> anyway, it, exactly. it's not a competition. It's it's sharing the information. We yeah. all, are, all are lifted up by, by sharing that information. Yeah. Definitely. So, panel, 